Okay, this is unit 9. This is the second part of this unit. It's going to look at emotion. Um, it is covered on page 366 to 367 in your textbook, and it is on page 8 in the notes. You may need some additional room because some of the notes are not uh, included in the packet, but you do still need to know it. The first video is going to look at emo emotional theories. So what really causes our emotion? Um, and there's different theories that come up with it. First, the importance of emotion. Motivated behavior is driven by powerful emotions that color and sometimes disrupt our lives. Emotions are our body's adaptive response. So it helps us adapt. They exist not to give us interesting ex experiences, but also enhance our survival. When we face challenges, emotions focus our attention and energize our action. Sometimes we have our eyes tear up, we begin to breathe heavy, etc. The concept of emotion emphasizes the arousal. You have both physical and mental things that happen to you. Motivation emphasizes how this arousal becomes action. So how do you get so um, excited about something or maybe you're not excited about something um, and then do a certain action. And then emotion and motivation are a complementary process. So they a lot of times they work together. Okay, so why do we have emotions? Emotions are a result of our genetics and our learning, especially early in life. Emotions serve as an arousal states that help organisms cope with important reoccurring situations. Their learned emotional responses, along with genetics, are important components of many psychological disorders, including depression, panic, panic attacks, and phobias. All right, so defining emotion, this is a key that you need to make sure you have written down. Emotions are a mix of the physiological arousal, so things that physically happen to your body, like the heart beating, pupils dilating. Okay, expressive behaviors, so how fast you're going to be about moving it or your actions that you're going to have. And then consciously experience thoughts and feelings, so thinking about what's occurring. Okay, so not only does it include the physical aspect of your body, it's going to show your behaviors of what's going on, and then it's also going to think about it. The hard part is understanding how they all fit together, and this is where they come up with the theories. Does the physical heart beating come first, and then you say, oh, I'm scared, or do you something where they both come at the same time, the heartbeat and the thought process come at the same time? So this is the question that theorists ask, does your heart pound because you're, you are afraid, or are you afraid because you feel your heart pounding? So kind of like, does the chicken come before the egg or the egg come before the chicken? In other words, did you physically feel your body change and then feel the emotional experience? Or did you have the emotional experience, the thought process in your head, and then all of a sudden your heart started pounding? So here's the three main theories that you do need to know. The James Lang, Cannon Bard, and Satcher, otherwise known as the two-factor theory, or the Satcher-Singer theory, see them in both. Same theory. Later, we'll get to extension theories, which is the lazarus satcher theory and the zadonk ladonk theory. So the first one is the James Lang theory. William James, we've heard about him before, um, thought it was common sense. We feel sorry because we cry, angry because we strike, and afraid because we tremble. He thought that you have a physical response and then you bring about the sense of emotion. Okay, Carl Lang supported his idea, and this became known then as the James Lang theory. So this is what it looks like. You have the physical, the physiological response. Okay, so all of a sudden, you see a car coming. All of a sudden, your arms are going to shake. You're all of a sudden, your blood pressure is going to rise. You're going to breathe heavy. Okay, and then you're going to have the emotion, fear. All right. Another example could be. You see a, um, a, an attractive woman or man walk into a room. Your heart's going to start beating, okay, and then you're going to think, oh, I'm nervous. Okay, so this is the James Lang theory. It might help if you draw this picture out in your notes. K. 
Karen Bard was somebody who kind of opposed this theory. Philip Bard um, concluded that the physiological arousal and our emotion experience actually happen at the same time. They're rooted at the same time to the brain's cortex awareness of emotion. Here's what the Cannon Bard theory looks like. You see the oncoming car, your heart pounds, and at the exact same time, you understand that that's fear. The physiological and Cannon Bard are experienced at the same time. Your heart pounds and you get nervous at the exact same time. Okay. Think of two cannons firing at the same time, the physiological heart beating and your understanding of emotion. Okay. The two-factor theory is another theory. This is the third theory you do need to know. Stanley Satcher and Jerome Singer propose a third theory. This is our physiological and cognitive perceptions, memories, and interpretations together create emotion. Emotions have two ingredients, the physical arousal and the cognitive label, and then you have your emotion. So this is kind of a picture of what it looks like. You see the oncoming car, okay? Your heart begins to pound, and then you say, I am afraid. This is an afraid fear, okay? And then all of a sudden you know it's fear. So you actually put the label on the idea. Okay, if your heart is pounding, you recognize that it's not pounding because you're in love. You're recognizing that that's actually something that's fear. Okay, so you see all of a sudden, let's say you're, you hear a loud scream in the next room. Okay, all of a sudden, the loud scream in the next room, okay, it's a fearful experience. Your heart's going to become pounding and you're going to say, I'm afraid. Heart's not pounding because all of a sudden an attractive male walked into the room or attractive female walked into the room. Okay, so kind of reviewing the three theories, kind of take a moment, maybe jot them down, and then try and see if you could figure out maybe from memory which one is which. So first one, emotions occur at the same time. That would be the Cannon Bard theory. The emotion follows a lag after the arousal. So first you have a physical arousal and then you have the emotion, which is the James Lang. You have an arousal and you have the cognitive label at the same time, then you have the emotion. Which is the Satcher thinger, Singer or the two-factor theory. Okay, continuing with the theories, there's two more we'll take a look at. And these are extensions to the Satcher Singer theory. So the Satcher thing, Singer theory was all about we need to put a label okay, on our emotions. Um, so Zedong uh, and Lado emphasize some emotion are immediate without conscious appraisal. So if you take a look at this diagram, what they argued is we have an event like a car accident take place. Okay, the emotional response happens so quick. Okay, you don't even think about the situation, no appraisal takes place, and then you think about the situation after. Oh, okay, so you have the event, the emotion, and then the, res the emotion, and then you kind of have the response. It's very fast, there's no room to think about the situation, no appraisal or that labeling takes place, you feel the situation, and then you think about it. Okay, so it's all when does the labeling actually take place. So Dunk thinks and argues, and Ledeau argues, that emotional reactions can be quicker than our interpretations of the situation. So it happens so quick, we see something, boom, we are reacting on it, or and then afterwards, we think about it. So we feel before we think. An example is, we feel scared in the woods and we hear a twig crack, before you even have time to think, you know that that's fear. Larius and Satcher and Singer. Larius and Satcher and Singer emphasize that appraise determines the emotion. So this is kind of very, it's the same thing as the Satcher Singer idea here. Okay, you have the event take place, the appraisal takes place, okay, and then the emotion responds. The only thing that's different here is there's no real, it doesn't talk about the physical aspects of what's taking place with your body. Okay, so you have the event, you have the thinking process, the appraisal, the labeling, and then you have the emotional response.
Okay, so you have the appraisal can help you determine the emotion, the event, the appraisal, the emotional response. You're putting the label on the emotion. Larius and Satcher Singer thinks argued that while our brain does not process a, a lot unconsciously, even an instant we um, we think about it and we felt the emotions require some sort of cognitive appraisal of the situation. Otherwise, how we how will we know what we're responding to? Okay. The appraisal may be effortless and may not be conscious of it, but it is still happening. A twig cracks, you appraise it, oh, it's scary, and then now you're going to feel, or I, or I should feel fear. I want to refresh your memory also as we're talking about emotion. There are different biological factors that go in with emotion. Um, not only do you have things happening to your physical sense of your body, but there's also a lot of brain activity. The hindbrain deals specifically with the reticular formation, helps sift through the information, and really looks for threats to keep you alive. The limbic system, the big part of the limbic system that handles emotion is your amygdala. Okay, it handles anger and arousal. And then your cerebral cortex. Um, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but it helps interpret events. The thought center, specifically the frontal lobe. The right hemisphere really specializes in negative emotion, understanding your negative emotions, facial expressions. And then left specializes in positive emotions. Okay, embodied emotion. Most people are aware that when we express emotions, physical changes happen to the body. Some you may notice, like sweating and crying and trembling. Others are without your conscious awareness, and we're going to review some of those. One thing as we're going through this is you should remember the nervous system as well. The nervous system is broken down into your peripheral and central nervous system. Central nervous system is the brain, spinal cord, and then you have your peripheral nervous system, which breaks down into autonomic and somatic. And then the autonomic, which we'll spend some time looking at again, looks at the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So your emotions are going to be either arousing the sympathetic nervous system or parasympathetic nervous system. It's, it's the calming, coming down. Make sure you draw this chart, have it in your notes, because again, we will be talking about this in this section. Peripheral nervous system is you need a little refresher. It's the somatic nervous system is the division of the peripheral nervous system that enables voluntary movements. So you're aware of these movements. Autonomic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that controls your glands and other muscles that we're not so aware of, your heartbeat, your dilation, your digestion. Okay, the sympathetic nervous system is the division of the autonomic nervous system that arouses the body and mobilizing its energy in stressful situations. Parasympathetic, then, is the division that calms the body and conserves energy. We've seen this chart before. Okay, things, actions that occur with the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight response. It is activated if you are in danger. Okay, things that are activated is oftentimes your um, the sympathetic nervous system. Your pupils dilate, your heartbeat accelerates. It prevents digestion, okay, because it's conserving all the energy for the heart to beat. Right, it is um, stimulating glucose and energy in your liver. The adrenal glands are creating epinephrine and norepinephrine. It relaxes your bladder so you don't have to go to the bathroom at this point in time. And it also can stimulate ejaculation in males. All right. On the other hand, you have your parasympathetic nervous system. It's the calm. It's known as the rest, and it allows digestion to take place at this time. Um, it contracts pupils. All right. It slows down the heartbeat. It stimulates your digestion. All right. It contracts your bladder and allows blood to flow back to your sex organs. Okay, so when you're under stress and your sympathetic nervous system is active, when you're under stress, your adrenal glands release the stress hormone epinephrine and norepinephrine. With this surge, your liver pours extra sugar into your blood, giving you energy. To help you burn the sugar, your respiration rises and your blood pressure increases. So these things help increase your blood pressure. Blood is sent to the muscles for better movement. It allows your eyes, um, it allows light into your eyes. Digestion does take place. When you're at the re relaxed state, hormones are no longer released or are um, released, but at a slower rate. 
Some linger for a bit, so it might take a, a little while for your body to calm down, especially if you have a lot of adrenaline going. The physiological similarities among specific emotions. So what physical things do they notice happening with your body that are similar between emotion to emotion? Are there differences in the physiological activity for someone who is angry, fearful, sexually aroused, or bored? From the control center, you might monitor a person's physiological responses, such as measuring their perspirations, how much they sweat, how much they breathe, how much their heart beats. With training, you could probably uh, pick out the bored individual, but concern physiologically differences among fear, anger, and sexual arousal would be very difficult. Your heart is going to race. Okay, your breathing is going to increase. You're going to be sweating. All right. Um, an example is your heart's going to race. Your the breathing's going to increase. People may feel different and look different in their emotional facial structures. However, the physical things that are happening to the body are pretty similar. So then, what are some physiological differences among specific emotions? What is changing from fear to joy in terms of people's bodies? There are some physiological differences to emotion. Fear and joy might activate similar heart rates. Okay, you're really excited, you're really scareful. However, they stimulate different facial expressions. And we will be looking at facial expressions later um, in another presentation. But for fear, your eyebrows usually tense. And for jo joy, your muscles in your cheeks and under your eyes pull into a smile. The brain activity can also be different. Brain scan shows that negative emotions are processed in the right hemisphere and positive emotions are more processed in the left hemisphere. Positive people also tend, um, also tend to trigger more left frontal lobe activity. Okay, And they say that this is um, positive people might be very active in this area. And this is where a lot of the dopamine receptors are dominant in the left frontal, hence might, what might make them so positive. Okay, so the last part of the text kind of just talks about, again, once reminding you about the cognitive and emotion when we actually label it. And there was two couples, remember, that were going back and forth trying to figure out when we should really emotion, label our emotion. Lar uh, Larius and Satcher Singer said that we should label it even if the event takes place for a brief second, we appraise it, and then we have the emotion. And Zedonk, uh, Lido and Zedonk, think that it should take place, you see the event, you experience the emotion, and then you label it.